And how successful is violence? How, how successful is the Algerian revolution following Van Harmon's uh, mantra of violence will lead to democracy and justice? How was the violent end of World War II? It led to the Cold War. 50 million people died in the Cold War. It, it was ended by violence and the triumph of the United States. Now we have a war on terror. Over a million people have died in Iraq already. How many people are dying in Afghanistan? If that's our success model, I think nonviolence maybe do so would do not too bad. There's this really interesting woman. I think she's actually Canadian. I think she's from Montreal. Her name is Barbara Demi. And in the civil rights movement, she wrote a book called um, uh, Revolution and Equilibrium. And she just she tried to answer your question in the context of the civil rights movement. What's working here? Is it, the non is it the violence around King, or is it King's non-violence? And I think that's one of the most caref careful empirical attempts to answer this question. In India itself, you have a whole, I realize Nehru went in one direction, uh, but you have a non-violent movement from, that sprung from Gandhi, one of his uh, most clo closest followers, a woman named Mira Ben, I'm sure you know. And she, in turn, founded a movement called the Chipko Movement in Northern <coughs> India, which is, just means tree hugging. Right? And it's back to the land, protect the environment, but completely nonviolent. And then Vandana Shiva, who's a nuclear physicist, joined them in the 80s and began to write about Earth democracy. That movement now in India has over a million people in it. They're committed to nonviolence. They've protected the forest in Northern India. They don't allow any uh, genetically modified seeds into northern India. Did I say northern Africa? Northern India. So you have a whole tradition here of ecofeminism in northern India that derives directly from Gandhi. It's based on uh, nonviolence. Even very interesting movement to gain its deeply uh, spiritual in this, uh, in a certain sense. So I, mean, I guess all I'm saying is. These aren't knockout arguments to your question. It's, it's such an important question for those of us who are think hard about and try to live a non-violent life. And, but I don't have any easy answers, so I'm just throwing out thoughts, I guess. Yes? Um, yes, I have two observations. I first, I mean, I, I do, um, uh, following up, I think, that very early question about you know, how you link these two types of citizenship, I was wondering what you think about Engel Ischen's uh, work, uh, who's, uh, where he's trying to uh, theorize acts of citizenship from below, but where I think, to my uh, to, to my knowledge, the, exactly the, the, the top top down citizenship approach is, is kind of missing. So that's you know it, it's nice to kind of theorize it from above, but if that is missing. The other the other observation that I had is when you um, argued that the cooperative citizenship movement, if you may call it like this. For them, the means are the end. And I was really reminded, and because you brought him up, uh, about Weber's uh, differentiation between the ethics of convictions and the, um, uh, and, uh, and the ethic of responsibility. So in the, Weber exactly calls the ethic of conviction exactly what he would call the, you know, the, where the means are uh, the ends, where there's no difference between them. You, know, you need to uh, act um, non-violently if you want to create non-violence. Uh, so that follows a different name giving than yours. Yes, yes. So I was wondering whether you were aware of those uh, of the of the kind of the difference in, in terminology here yeah. and where the the kind of concept of responsibility um, fits into you know, your description or your, your analysis of the two types of of, uh, of citizenship. Here. Yes. Okay. And what's the oh, the first question okay. was the. Uh, the, the research is being done in Canada by people who are following cooperative citizenship but are not interested in linking it up in any way. Yeah, I'm watching that movement. Another good example of that is Richard Day yes. at Queen's and... Um, but then you end up with anarchism. That's, I mean, that's exactly yes. my, my problem here. So <laughs> if, in the sense that, yes, if we accept that, and if, and also for us who are involved in, in you know, uh, networks like Metropolis, who try to kind of, uh, you know, precisely build in NGOs and from below, and we see how dysfunctional and sometimes not very fruitful this approach is. We, I'm just wondering whether, you know, where can that, that relationship, this connection, how, how can it come about? 
Yeah, I mean, between the two yeah. types of research, you mean? Yeah. And or, two types of, 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 of uh, citizen. Know, yeah. Citizen. yeah, that's a good question, because you have it, the same uh, division within indigenous America, yeah. profound yeah. America. You have yeah. people like Ty Gay Alfred, who doesn't want anything to do with representative institutions, whether it's the AFN or it's the, the uh, colonizers. Mm -hmm institutions, but other people like John Burroughs, who is trying to bring these two together. But I mean, what can you do about that? I mean, people are, you get, keep talking to these people, and you hope in time you can uh, get them in the same room and so on, <laughs> maybe on the same uh, picket line or whatever. Yeah, so I'm correcting old Weber there on responsibility, he's just got his terminology wrong. And he's so, I mean, great man lots of important insights about modernity, but so hardwired into that, what I'm calling that institutional piece of modernization. And he just really believes, well, this is wrong, I think it's his followers really believe that modernity just differentiates itself into these separate value spheres. Religion here, morality here, politics here, law here. And the cooperatives say, no, it's not a horizontal differentiation. But the problem is that horizontal differentiation of religions, politics, morality, and law is hardwired into the modern citizenship module and its institutional structure. So when somebody uh, enacts their religious practices as a way of serving public goods, it calls into question that differentiation thesis that you get in favor and then picked up by the Frankfurt School re-elaborated by Habermas in our time. And I just, and they, they think it's a kind of regress to uh, a non-modernity or pre-modernity. And we have to come along and say there are alternative modernities. And here's what gives coherence. And it is, a, it is an ethic of responsibility. I just think Faber got the terminology wrong here. Only one more question. <laughs> one way at the back. Um, your mom posits that you know you have the, the uh, first you have the uh, modern citizenship, and then the uh, cooperative citizenship is a response to the ineffectiveness of the institution of modern citizenship. Uh, but there are uh, states where uh, that have resisted modernity, and where the institutions of modern citizenship do not exist. Do you see? Uh, Cooperative citizenship, is there any chance that it can emerge in those states? And, and if so, how do you see that happening? Yes, I think cooperative citizenship emerges in every society. I believe that premise of cooperative citizenship, that we're in social relations, in what Marcel Moss called gift economies, the minute we step out of these large global market relations and live in more local market relations or non-market relations. So this kind of cooperation and mutual assistance exists everywhere humans have been able to survive. I really, I think that's really the last hundred years of people correcting Dar the Darwinians are, are right about that. So it exists in societies that haven't undergone modernization through these four tiers. But what they've been constrained to accept is the tier one institutions. And that's been dis disruptive of local economies. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I've been working over an issue uh, here in Canada. And it kind of came out of a uh, on Ontario, Ontario Human Rights Commission uh, ruling on a, uh, a case of a Falun Gong member in 2002 who was who was ejected from a an Ottawa Chinese cultural association <coughs> for for the per affiliation with Falun Gong. Now, what the, the the problematic I'm trying to solve here is that the ruling designated uh, Falun Gong as a religious creed. Now, the Ontario Human Rights Commission also has a designation of religion. But what's, what's interesting about this is that the designation of religion does not include personal, moral, or political affiliation, uh, uh, you know, inclinations. And so it would seem that in this, in this sense, uh, in your model of cooperative 
cooperative citizenship, that the very political, politically um, charged nature of the Falun Gong movement sort of inhibits that extra step of becoming a religion or just remaining a creed. So that cooperation in this sense, at least in Canada, is kind of may have uh, affected that that judgment, that kind of situation. So I don't know if you can speak to that. I can't because I don't know the rules of legislation at all. I'll take something. <laughs> what were you saying? You guys at the reception and the dinner are ready. Yes, okay, yeah. So. <laughs> the people can ask. Uh, okay. If you want to take one more question. One more question. Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> Martin. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I guess it's it's a bit of a bit. I'm not sure if it's a variation on the theme that has been uh, discussed quite a bit in the events or uh, some of it, I, I guess. But what I'm wondering is modern citizenship is based, as you said, many times on. Uh, fairly uh, embedded in fairly strong institutions, institutions of modern liberal state. And I'm uh, trying to figure out, okay, so uh, the cooperative model of citizenship is also uh, embedded somehow in some f institutional forms. I'm assuming the cooperative movement or cooperative structure, uh, or maybe not. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what you can say about this sort of institutionalization of this, or what kind of form of institutionalization it would take. Is it an alternative to the state, or is it within the sort of straight state structure? And then my second, my sub-question to this is, uh, I would need to be convinced that the cooperative form is a strong enough institution to sustain a, a social organization that is greater than just a fairly small community. Uh, and, and so, uh, the, the sort of two sides of the question. Yes. Well, I think I would want to define cooperative organizations at, at only organizations where the, the, the people who are subject to that organization cooperated, operated together democratically. So there are a lot of official co-ops around the world, as Joel knows better than I do, that would fall foul of this condition. They're not internally democratic. And it's one of the it's one of the problems of cooperation that begins as a practice, non-institutionalized, and then as it grows, it becomes less internally democratic. It's even literature now on Amnesty International as uh, looking like a mirroring a mirroring, mirror, 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 uh, uh, private institution where it's internally it's run on a bureaucratic model of organization. So. I would be very hard line in my, that would be the normative part of my definition. I would only count a co-op as a, a form of organization of humans in which humans themselves exercise their political powers of self-government. If it falls foul of that, I mean the line you could draw at different places, but that would be the condition that it's internally, the relations with it, in it are internally democratic. And then the question is, your second question is, how big can that kind of organization go? Well, pretty big. Why not? Why not? Why not fair trade? Why not where producers and consumers get together and negotiate the price, the working conditions, the consuming conditions, the recycling conditions? I just don't see why we can't sustain organizations over the long term. They may even take on that's what we mean by institutionalization and their degrees of institutionalization. But institutions like that that are internally democratic, like uh, departments and universities that are self-governing with their faculty members and so on, uh, they can sustain uh, democratic relations of governance in Foucault's very basic sense of uh, relations between partners, even with uh, institutionalization taking place around them. But, again, this is another research project, I think. What are the conditions? You know this uh, <coughs> new book by Volker called International NGOs, where he says if we look at them, they, they just grow for a little while democratically, and then they become bureaucratic organizations, and they lose their self-governing character. But we have to do a lot more research on that and respond to that. Why is it? that they drift off into this uh, non-democratic form uh, that looks like a public ministry and so on. 